I'm Gary and this is episode 103 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at destination charging. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. Before we start, I wanted to remind you early on about the segment I'm doing called Disconnected. Let me set the scene. We've talked before many times on this podcast about how the charging infrastructure is getting better and better every single day. But the flip side to that is illustrated regularly on my Twitter feed with people having issues when charging. It could be broken charges, it could be having to wait, it could be poor charger etiquette. It could just be handshake issues with your vehicle. So I wanted to gather together some of these stories and recount them for the listeners. If you have an interesting charging story, preferably where you had an issue that caused you a problem, send it to me at uh, evmusings at gmail.com. Let me know if you want me to use your name, and if selected, I'll add it to a future episode of the podcast. There's a lot of talk in the media about the poor charging network in the UK, and indeed in many other countries around the world. Stories of charges not working, or failing, or being blocked by other users, or being iced. Basically, the sort of stories that are tabloid fodder for the anti-EV brigade. It's fair to say that the gap between what the charging network provides and what is needed is bigger than we would like it to be at the moment. There's one particular Twitter commenter who seems to add something to all of my tweets, or he did before I blocked him, which said, we must have national infrastructure charging every 30 miles, brackets government policy, on motorways and A and B roads everywhere. I counted that he wrote the same thing in 30 separate tweets in a period of one week. He's also talking about rapid charges and doesn't seem to be interested in any other sort of charging. Now, obviously, we'd all like thousands and thousands of charges every 30 miles along every motorway in A and B road. But it does bring up several interesting questions about this proposal. The first is, where are these rapid charges going to be located? As people like Tom Callow and Ian Johnson have said on this very podcast, they can't just randomly slot a rapid charging hub in anywhere they want one. They need landlords who give them permission to install the charges. They need power feeds from a DNO allowing them enough electricity to provide provide the charge. They need planning permission from the local authorities to actually put this in place. GridServe are the closest they've come to this mythical model, and they've currently got a grand total of one electric forecourt in place, with one more being built. It's a slow and tedious process. Planning permission alone takes a long time. But there is an alternative option which doesn't get the credence it needs in many parts of the media and EV circles. Destination charging. When I talk about destination charging, I'm talking about the ability of a car to sit in one place for a relatively long period of time and charge at a relatively low rate while the owner does something else. This is distinct from home charging, although the difference is not always obvious. Remember, as drivers, our vehicles generally spend a huge proportion of their time sitting doing nothing, about 90-95%, to depending who you listen to. As an example, in the local station car park near where where I live, there is a brand new Porsche Taycan that spends a minimum of 10 hours per workday sitting there while its owner commutes, presumably into London, to work. Now, there's a different discussion to be had about buying an expensive car like that for doing the short daily commute to the railway station, but that's a topic for another time. What it does highlight is that there is the need for charges to be placed in places where cars will be stopped for long periods of time. That is destination charging. In my mind, and this is obviously open to interpretation, Destination charging falls into a number of subtypes. There's workplace charging, there's car park charging, there's overnight charging. Let me explain what I think the differences are. Workplace charging is straightforward. It's where you have, you know, seven kilowatt chargers installed in the car park at work. You plug in when you get there, your car charges while you work, and you leave with your battery topped up or similar. Podcast co-founder Simon does this with his i3, which is useful as he doesn't have home charging. He can drive to work, plug it in, and leave with a full battery. I charged at work on a seven kilowatt new motion charger. Uh, I, I leave my car basically plugged in for the day. So if it's cold or it's warm, I can preheat or cool uh, when I come out. No one else uses it, which is good. And um, that's approximately 10p a kilowatt as well. So with the journey back home, um, I'll probably be left with a 90 mile uh, range on the guesser meter. And that will put me in good stead for Wednesday's journey um, to a customer site. Workplace charging is usually something that's a cost to the employee, as well as the employer, as the electricity in the units have to be paid for somehow. But that's fine because if you've had a nice car and you filled it with fuel, you've had to pay for it as well. 
Often charging on things like this can be outsourced to a charge point operator such as New Motion, who will provide an RFID card to track usage and enable billing. Also, OZEV, the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles, will provide grants of up to £10,000 to enable the installation of workplace chargers. So there really is no excuse. Car park charging is where banks of chargers are installed in places where people park their cars on an ad hoc basis. Typical examples of this are the chargers which are installed in places such as the Meadow Hall Shopping Centre in Sheffield. There are 56 chargers loc located across two different car parks. I was there a few weeks ago for a couple of hours, plugged in when I arrived, and the car was topped up when I left for my journey back down south. At the time I was there, the chargers were free, but I believe since then they've been handed over to Vend Electric, a company that requires payment for them. Supermarket chain Tesco have partnered with Podpoint to provide several units at many of the major stores across the country plug in and charge while you shop. Podpoint themselves provide various 7 kilowatt units at different parking locations across the UK. Simon and I deliberately chose a Costa Coffee near Maidenhead for a meetup once because they had a set of Podpoint chargers in the car park. We got there, plugged in, started the charge, grabbed a Costa, free charging for an hour. Magic. The list of places where fast chargers have been installed as part of their creation is increasing all the time. Examples include the Oracle in Reading, Meadow Hall, as mentioned previously, the Kennett Centre in Newbury, Broadmarch Multi-Story in Nottingham, the Multi-Story Car Park in Bracknell High Street, the Trafford Centre in Manchester, Monk's Cross Shopping Park in Leeds, and the Granger Town Car Park in Newcastle, to name but a few. The idea, obviously, is to leave your car plugged in while you go and do something else. Imagine taking the family out for an evening. You arrive at 7pm, park and plug in, then you have a meal, visit the cinema to enjoy that latest Marvel slash Pixar slash Star Wars movie. I think that's all they show at cinemas nowadays, right? And when you come back at 10.30, you've got, say, 15 kilowatt hours of charge put into your car. Obviously, depending on the maximum speed the charger outputs and the maximum speed the car accepts on AC current. The MG ZS EV, for example, accepts 6.6 .6 kilowatts on a 32 amp 7 kilowatt charger. The Tesla Model 3 accepts 7.4 kilowatts on that same charger, increasing to 11 kilowatts on a three-phase 6 amp charger. Your VW ID3 is the same as the Tesla. Overnight charging is what I think many people think of as destination charging. This is when you make a longish journey to a location with the intention of staying there overnight. Examples of this are hotels with Tesla destination chargers on them. The idea is that you can stay in the hotel or in, plug in and be sure that your car is charged when you awake the following morning. A quick glance at the Tesla charging map indicates that there are literally hundreds of places in the UK with Tesla destination charging and many, many more worldwide. But there are many places where destination charging doesn't involve having a Tesla charger installed. There are Airbnb locations who use things such as Podpoint home chargers, Zappies and similar to allow guests to charge their car while staying. There is a company called Zero Carbon World with a mission to install chargers in as many places as possible to facilitate the rollout of EVs. They're marked as zero net units on Zapmap and are generally free to the end user. All of these are destination chargers. But there's more. Have you ever been out for the day to somewhere like Legoland, Chessington World of Adventures or a National Trust location? A lot of them have chargers installed in their car parks. Although to be fair, some of them don't. Shame on you, Alton Towers. This counts as destination charging and can mean if you're there for a whole day, you may end up being 100% charged when you leave to go home, totally removing any anxiety you may have had. If you're heading to Harry Potter World in Watford, they have 22 pod point units literally right outside the main entrance. You can spend the day being a muggle, checking out Diagon Alley, and come back to a full battery. More recently, however, another aspect of this has come into play. That is wireless charging. We did a whole episode on wireless charging back in Season 3. There's a link in the show notes. In there, we focused on the benefits of wireless charging as it applies to things such as taxis and buses, who can park over these chargers when stationary, either at taxi ranks or bus stops. The technology is advanced enough that 80 kilowatt charge speeds are possible via a wireless charge pad. But a company called Char-G, that's C-H-A-R dot G-Y, has introduced a pilot in Marlow, Buckinghamshire, which uses wireless induction charging on on-street situations. The pilot uses 10 Renault Zoe's fitted with aftermarket charging pads. They literally pull to a stop over the specific charging pad and the vehicle starts charging. This is ideal for on-street charging as it moves the issue of trailing wires across pavements, etc. My recent trip up to London where I parked for 20p in Islington for four hours would have benefited greatly from having a wireless charging pad under the car to add some electrons while I did what I was doing up there. There are, however, a couple of issues when it comes to destination charging that need to be discussed. The first one is that of etiquette. 
We'll do a complete episode on charging etiquette soon, but in the meantime, let's discuss how this applies to destination charging. The main issue at the moment with destination chargers is that there are usually not many of them. We have given a couple of examples, so places like Meadow Hall have 56 of them, but they're an exception. But if you go to somewhere like the Best Western Hotel Bristol at Newquay, they have three Tesla destination chargers which are open to the public. Generally, with Tesla destination chargers, if there's more than one of them, then one of the units allows charging by non-Tesla vehicles. That's why they have different colour signage. Red for Tesla, white for the public. So what happens when three Teslas get to this location and plug in from, say, half seven at night until eight the following morning? There's no more units left for charging. If friend of the podcast Rob Shaw turns up in his ID3 at 2200 after travelling all the way down there from Hertfordshire, he's got nowhere to plug in. Or, as will probably be the case, what happens when Rob and another EV turn up to find three empty chargers, but only one of which is usable by a non-Tesla vehicle? How do they share this charge? Answer, they can't. More importantly, how do you deal with the situation when someone is parked in the only available parking slot, either in an EV or an ICE car, but it's not actually charging? Most hotels don't track their customers' registration numbers, so trying to work out who owns the car could be an exercise in futility. The second issue is related to that previous comment around having enough chargers. At the moment, Tesla destination chargers are in, are in the order of magnitude of one to three per location. Given that EVs in general and Teslas in particular are selling at an ever increasing rate, the number on the road gets more and more each day. Sooner or later, the number of destination chargers is going to be outweighed by the number of cars. That's an issue. The simple solution is to add more chargers. But that brings in additional issues which need to be dealt with. Who pays for them? How do we ensure enough power is coming into the site to power them? It's all well and good if you're a central London hotel connected to the main grid in the city. But how about our locations such as Tour Eiffel in Hotel out in the western reaches of southern Wales, or the Skay Boast House Hotel on the Isle of Skye? Can they support more destination charges without major infrastructure upgrades? Or the Renville House Hotel and Resort in Galway Island? Some of these places are lacking infrastructure as it exists. Adding this extra increase in power requirements is going to be expensive. Somebody has to pay for these infrastructure improvements. Is it the government? The Office for Zero Emission Vehicles has a fund that can be used by local governments to help install chargers. But are they using it? Some local governments and councils are doing this. This is particularly noticeable in places such as Oxford and York, where the council have implemented charging hubs in the local park and ride locations. Oxford is implementing a hub in the Redbridge Park and Ride, and York is implementing 450 kilowatt rapid chargers and 450 kilowatt ultra rapid chargers at Monk's Cross Park and Ride and next to Poppleton Park Park and Ride. And they're calling these EV hyperhubs. And we'll talk in more detail about council involvement in EV charging in a later episode this season. If I want you to take away one thing from this episode, it's this. Rapid chargers are not the be all and end all of charging infrastructure. Sure. Everyone wants them so they can charge quickly while they take a pee and grab a coffee at a motorway service area. But to leverage the 90 plus percent of time that a vehicle is stationary during the day, there has to be a better way of using this time. Destination charging is the answer. If you can couple that with wireless charging, you might have a solution that's both practical, scalable, and relatively cheap. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. We go on and on about renewables being the way forward, but one criticism of them, quite rightly, is that they're not a constant. When it's dark, the sun stops shining. When it's still, wind turbines don't work. So what happens then? A website has been created which runs from a server powered solely by renewable energy. And I'm not talking about having an energy supplier who sources renewable energy from across the country and pipes it into the grid. I'm talking about a server where the electricity to run that server comes from solar panels and a battery co-located with the server itself. The site is called Low Tech Magazine and it covers, appropriately enough, topics in the renewable energy space. Since the 12th of January 2020, the website runs on a 30 watt solar panel and a new 168 watt hour lead acid battery. From September 2018 to January 2020, the website was powered by a 50 watt solar panel and an old 86 watt hour battery. What's more interesting is that the background colour of the website indicates the state of the battery. When there's lots of power, it's yellow. When the power drops, it gets darker. If the sun goes in and the battery runs dry, the website goes offline. At the time of writing, it had been up for five weeks, four days, 21 hours and 29 minutes. 
We were told that the internet would dematerialize society and decrease energy use, and contrary to this projection, it's become a large and rapidly growing consumer of energy itself. According to the latest estimates, the entire network already consumes 10% of global electricity production, with data traffic doubling roughly every two years. The website was created as a low-tech answer to this problem. Check it out, read some of the articles. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. ZapMap is the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK. Use it to search for available chargers, plan electric journeys, pay for charging on participating networks, and share updates with other EV drivers. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features, such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Thanks for listening. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this particular episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings. That's ko-fi.com slash evmusings. And you can do just that. Takes Apple Pay too. If you want a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingsEV with the words, the journey is the destination, hashtag if you know you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he's meticulous about the clothes he wears when he's at work, spends hours and hours choosing the right tie, matching hanky in the pocket, polishing his shoes. He lays everything out on the bed the night before so it's ready to wear when he gets up. Of course, there's a reason for this. And that will put me in good stead for Wednesday's journey um, to a customer site. Thanks for listening. Bye.